In this week's episode of Exhibitionist, we're venturing into the wild world of the animal kingdom. We'll meet a celebrity photographer wowed by one of nature's greatest beings. An origami artist is here to teach us how to make a magical unicorn. We'll head into the studio of a taxidermist reimagining squirrels in unexpected ways. We'll learn how to make a swan in our morning latte. Kim's convenience star Paul Lee tells us about the shark that changed his life. And one ceramist explains how she used animals to tell stories of Canada. <laughs> Hello and welcome to CBC Arts Exhibitionists, your whirlwind guide to the innovative and imaginative art scenes happening every day across Canada. I'm your host, Amanda Paris. Dave Howells is a rock star in the photography world. Amy Winehouse, George W. Bush, and even Dog the Bounty Hunter have all been captured by his lens. With a resume like that, he's not easy to intimidate. But during one trip to Newfoundland, Dave encountered a creature so big, he was humbled. You can be set up, you can be looking the right direction, you can have, uh, the light can be perfect, but if they're not gonna jump, or they're not gonna do something, then you're not getting a picture. Five years ago, my buddy Joe um, said, you should come out on doing some whale watching. And so I was like, well, you know, God's gift to photography. Of course, I'm going to be nail this, you know, first time out. And of course, it was a total disaster. I got like half a tail and, you know, a breach that was this big that was out of focus. And, you know, I, you know so I did what every self-respecting photographer would do, would buy an enormous lens and a faster camera. So, you know, try and stack the odds. A lot of the times the breaching ones, uh, they'll start flapping around first. You know, one of their fins will start slapping, and that's an indicator that something might happen, that there's gonna be some jumping going on, or at least some action. And again, with the tail flopping, when they sort of flop the tails around, it gives you that that's the one that's gonna, if somebody, if anybody's gonna be jumping, that's the one that's gonna be jumping. I don't look at the back of the camera, because that's how you miss things. So we're out on the boat, and this guy is jumping up and down, uh, but he's not in the right place. And, and I said, okay, I need to go this way. So I'm giving direction. I, I can't help it, I'm art directing out on the boat, saying, saying, no, no, we need to go this way, we need to be shooting into the sun. And then when it jumped up, it was exactly where I was looking. I just pulled it up, let rip. And these things are super fast, so it's like a sequence of it coming up and splashing down. And then, because I'm a jerk, I then uh, turned to the captain and said, yeah, I think we can go in now. See, I told you I was a joke. <laughs> I didn't look at it until we got back shore. I knew I got it. I'm not a wildlife photographer. I never did any wildlife stuff before I got to Newfoundland. You know, it was all news and portraits and all this sort of stuff. And, it, it, it's, and it's very easy, N not easy, and that's the strong word, but you know, you, you, all your training comes in and, and you know that you're in a situation that you've been there before and, you, and you've done it before, and you know that what you have to do to get it again. But with this, it's, the challenge is, is that you're not in control at all. When they do show themselves, then it's your ability to make something essentially out of nothing. It is luck. It's all of this is luck. It, it's because, uh, you know, uh, it's totally up to them. Do you think you could create a giraffe out of 13 circles? It seems like an impossible task to me, but this week's exhibitionist in residence, Dorota Pankowska, was up for the challenge. You'll be seeing her menagerie throughout the show. Here's Dorota to tell you more. Hi, I'm Dory. I'm an artist from Toronto. This week, I'm your exhibitionist in residence. You're gonna see my animated animal gifts, an 
each one is made entirely from 13 circles. Check out more of my weird and playful projects by following my social media handle at Dory the Giant. Bye! On runways last season, Valentino made unicorn-inspired bomber jackets. In salons, there are currently offers on unicorn hair color. At CBC, we even have Gary the unicorn who specializes in hugs. Unicorns are everywhere. So, in celebration of this mystical creature, I've asked Joseph Wu, one of Canada's preeminent origami artists, to teach us how to make a unicorn with paper. Take it away, Joseph. My name is Joseph Wu, I'm an origami artist, and today I'll be showing you how to make a unicorn. So the first step, as always, is to pick your paper. This is a square of elephant hide paper, which is stiff and crisp and holds a crease very well. Unlike most origami, I like to do a lot of pre-creases before I actually start building the form. So the first step is just to make a lot of lines that will guide the construction of the shape later. So these are all of the pre-creases for the unicorn. So now that we have all of the guidelines completed, the paper can be collapsed into what is known as a base, the underlying structure for the unicorn. So during this collapse, very few new creases will ever be made because most of them are already in place. So here's the unicorn at this stage. We've got the horn, nose, ears, mane, forelegs, body, tail. From here, we add the details that will make this into a unicorn. Get that horn put in place. And basically, all those little bunched up layers need to be opened up to form the hoof. So now we start shaping the mane and the tail. And so this is how you make an origami unicorn. even fold it properly so it's even. Okay, so next is like uh, one on Jaws. You know, Jaws, uh, that yeah. scared me. And do you like squirrels at all? Are you like into, are you a? Uh... No comment. Let's keep it moving. Okay, roll camera please. And in three, two. Taxidermy is something you generally expect to find in a hunter's lodge, a moose head mounted on a wall, or a bear standing in a corner. But this week, we're going to the studio of one artist from Yukon who has chosen to use her taxidermy skills in quirky and interesting ways. What's her animal of choice? Squirrels. Take a look. My name is Cindy Kleppenstein, and I have a weird hobby that is taxidermying squirrels. And dressing them up as people, um, movie scenes, famous musicians, athletes, that kind of stuff. The most popular ones, I would say, were ice fishing squirrel, there's the play squirrel, hula squirrel, also Slash from Guns N' Roses is a real popular one. 
The way that I got interested in taxidermy was I uh, studied fine arts at the University of Manitoba. And while I was studying, actually, I was working the summers at a hunting and fishing lodge. And that's kind of when I started thinking about it. So from there, I just started to research taxidermy and realized like how artistic and creative it is and thought that it might be a, like a good occupation for me to uh, use those skills. I had a friend who was a trapper who just like showed up at my house with a bag full of squirrels and said like practice on these. As I was learning, I had a bunch of accidents along the way where I'd cut off a foot or cut off the hand or something like that. So the first, the first squirrel that I did was a pirate because I had cut off his leg and his hand. And, um, and then it kind of just took off from there. My first gallery show, which was really exciting because it was kind of a lifelong dream of mine having gone to art school. And it was an amazing response. Like so many people came out, the place was packed. We did an auction and we auctioned off the squirrels throughout the night. So there were like bidding wars on every squirrel and like everything sold. Sold one to a lady in New York the other day. There's a lot of weird people out there that are into weird stuff. And it's a really good gift for, you know, weird people. There's actually several trappers just from around the Yukon who have found out about this thing that I'm doing and obviously trying to trap larger, more valuable critters than squirrels, but inevitably these squirrels will fall into their traps. And so a few of these guys have just started bringing them to me. People in the North definitely connect to this because it's a huge part of our way of life as Yukoners is the hunting, like hunting, fishing, trapping, that whole industry. People think it's funny and that's basically what it's, what it's supposed to be. It's just supposed to make people laugh. Yeah, we're gonna call that a fit. Just perfect fit. Hi guys, my name is Andrew Bassett. I'm the owner and operator of Little Victories Coffee in Ottawa and today I'm gonna teach you how to pour swans. So with swans, you start by doing your circular movements for the blending. You then drop a base, the same way you would for a tulip. You drag a wing up to the top left-hand side of the cup. You push your neck down the base of the rosetta wing, and then you pull around the body, lift up, drop a head, and then pull through to finish. Children and adults jumped in their seats. The theme music left people shaken to their core, and entire generations proclaimed they would never enter the ocean again. When the movie Jaws was released in 1975, it was the first summer blockbuster. But at its core, it was a horror film that stayed with every kid who saw it, including Paul Lee, the star of Kim's Convenience. Here he is to tell you more about the film that changed his life. Hi, my name is Paul Sun Young Lee. I play Appa on uh, Kim's Convenience, and uh, the movie that changed my life uh, was Jaws. You're gonna need a bigger boat. My parents, for whatever reason, thought it was wise to take a five-year-old to the movies with them. Uh, so it was myself, my sister, my mom, and my dad. And the movie theater was so crowded, my dad was sitting behind me uh, for the entire movie. And Jaws, for those of you who haven't seen it, get on that, first of all, because it's a fantastic movie. Roy Scheider plays Chief Martin Brody. He's the chief of police on Amity Island. Uh, he's a father of two, and um, he's afraid of the water. And in this story of Jaws, he is forced to kind of confront that fear by going out in the water to hunt the shark that has been terrorizing and killing people in his town. You yell shark? We've got a panic on our hands on the 4th of July. There's one scene where they've discovered that the shark is still out in the loose and they're trying to find him and they come across um, this fishing boat that's just sort of been abandoned. And at the exact same time, my dad slowly reached over the back of my seat. This head pops out. And it freaked me right out. So I screamed, I jumped, like I think I almost peed my pants. My dad's laughing 
and then everybody else starts to laugh too. I, I realized that it's okay to be scared because afterwards you can kind of laugh at it. So it was a wonderful release. You were just stubborn. You were stubborn. <laughs> Nowadays you see characters, you, you, we're presented with these heroes who are like super muscular, super good looking, who aren't afraid of anything. And um, you know, but back in the 70s, there really was a sense that these were real guys. Even though he's scared of the water, he goes out there because he needs to protect his family. And with Appa, it's, there's a lot of stuff that he'd rather not have to do. That's why we need to stick together. And then you remember, I'm doing it for my family. So in a very long, windabout way, um, Jaws was the movie that kind of set it off for me. God give to you two ears and one mouth. Listen two more times, then you're talking. But I'm the one who said Stop. that- Stop. Listen. Listen. Okay, so one more piece. This one is about this cool ceramicist. Cer cram Ceramist? Ceramist. Yeah. Ceramist. Don't hurt yourself. Okay, I won't. Okay, <laughs> so three. From Watership Down to Animal Farm, literature has often used animals to investigate human nature. So when the Gardner Museum asked ceramist Janet McPherson to make a show in response to Canada 150, she decided to tackle this huge request by creating over 100 porcelain creatures in order to tell gently subversive stories of Canada. Take a look. The Gardner Museum wanted to do an exhibition for Canada's 150 and the director of the museum, Calvin Brown, approached me to see if I was interested in creating work for this show and of course I was. But it was a process getting to what the show was actually going to entail. The title of the show, A Canadian Bestiary, really talks about this idea of animals as an allegory. Uh, the meaning of the word bestiary is a compendium of beasts that are kind of telling this moralizing tale, and they're from the medieval era, but I was using it as a contemporary setting for uh, this drama that, that's unfolding, which is Canada. And I really felt feel like the animals offer the viewer an insight into human behavior because they're gestural and they're they're looking at each other and they're following each other and they're they're in these situations where I think people can actually relate to these animals on a human level. The exhibition is split up into four installations. There's Reliquary, North of North, Migration, and Decoy. Canada gets to be seen as this really um, progressive place where, where we're really doing a lot to promote environmental sustainability. Uh, we're taking in refugees, we're, you know, we have universal health care, we're, we're really treating our people well, but there's always these blind spots that are, that are there, and I just wanted to maybe address some of those in a subtle way where it was kind of allegorical rather than like obvious and, and didactic. I use porcelain as my main clay body, and I just love the way it looks as a fired piece. Um, I love the strength of it, the translucency of it, the crispness of the white. I wanted to kind of recreate these like plastic toys and sort of kitsch objects that I was collecting in thrift stores and uh, toy stores. And that really led me into making this kind of menagerie of these porcelain animals. And then it kind of just became this thing where the animals could really uh, stand in for humans and they could really be a window into for the viewer to sort of get this narrative that was going on without being too explicit. 
I wanted it to be a little bit of a contemplative space rather than a, you know, rah, rah, Canada, we're so great kind of feel. I mean, I really appreciate being a Canadian and living in Canada and I'm really happy that I live here. Um, but I also didn't want to miss the chance to kind of talk about these issues. All these different themes sort of question larger ideas of like what we should be doing as a country or, you know, how as Canadians we can like be, you know, more responsible for our, our environment and for our people. If there is a Canadian artist you think we should showcase, send us a message on Twitter or Facebook. Our handle is at CBC Arts. Thank you for joining me on this whirlwind journey of art and creativity. I'll be back again next week with even more artists from Summerside to Enterprise. Peace. Awesome show. Thank Amazing. you. Amazing. Man, that Jaws segment oh, really brought me back. So scary. I was so, so scared when I was a kid. I still get scared by Jaws. It's so incredible how films are able to use fear as a storytelling device because yeah. it really brings out people's base emotion. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. No, it works. That's why they they still sell. It's true. What um what other kind of things are you scared of? Uh, so many of the '80s horror films left me traumatized for life. Like Chucky, I oh, am still scared dolls. of dolls. Yeah, definitely. Ginger dolls. No, oh, thanks. so many, so many bugs. So many. Anyways. What are your fears? You know what? You're gonna make fun of me, so I don't. I'm not know. gonna Rather make fun like, of you. Just, just tell me. I told you mine. I'm really scared of people like staring at me, really like looking into my soul, really like getting into like who I am. Okay, stop. See, I get out. No, get away from me. 